Hello and welcome to this instructor sponsored webinar on Hypothesis in Canvas. I'm Jeremy Dean, the Director of Education at Hypothesis. We're going to be talking today about the Hypothesis Collaborative Annotation Tool and its integration through LTI into the Canvas LMS. A big thank you to the partnership folks at Instructure for promoting this webinar. Looks like we've got quite a crowd. The number keeps crawling up and uh, I'm just I'm super excited that, that folks are excited about annotation. You can open this deck through the bit.ly link there at the bottom, bit.ly hype in can. Uh, there are some links in the slides that might be useful to you uh, down the road. Here's an agenda for our hour together this afternoon. I'll be talking a bit broadly about hypothesis and annotation and education, and then providing a demo of hypothesis in Canvas. And then most important, we'll be hearing from a round table of practitioners, educators who've been using hypothesis in Canvas in their teaching to hear about their experiences. So I'm gonna to try to keep my stuff short so that we can really get to hearing their stories and uh, conversation. First, a bit about Hypothesis, the organization. I think it's fair to say that Hypothesis is a unique technology company like Instructure Canvas. We have our origins in open. Though we're here today to focus on a product offering we've launched in the education space, we have an open source standard-based browser extension that's free to use on the web and always will be. It lacks uh, some of the fun key functionality though that's necessary for using Hypothesis successfully in the classroom, which is why we're focused on developing the Hypothesis LMS app into an enterprise offering for educational institutions. But that product is still powered by open source code and our company remains committed to open principles more broadly. I wanna give a shout out to the whole Hypothesis team, uh, give people a glimpse of the folks behind the tool. We're humans too. Um, this is a really amazing group of people truly dedicated to creating a transformative tool for education and for the web and doing so in a way that begins with the learner and focuses on teaching. Uh, you may see my colleagues Nate Angel and Caitlin LeMay in the chat answering questions and sharing resources. Hi Caitlin, hi Nate. So my background is actually as an educator. Uh, I have a PhD in English, I taught high school English, I taught college English and composition. Uh, and every term that I taught, I always handed out this poem at the beginning, uh, Billy Collins' Ode to Annotation Marginalia. Uh, from day one, I made the point of encouraging students to write in their books and other readings, because I believe that annotation was the most critical practice that would influence their performance in almost every aspect of my courses, class participation, quiz taking, test taking, paper writing, everything. There's perhaps nothing more essential to learning than reading, and there's nothing more essential to reading than annotation. As Billy Collins writes, we've all seized the white perimeter as our own and reached for a pen, if only to show we did not just laze in an armchair turning pages. We pressed a thought into the wayside, painted an impression along the verge. Scholars, students, and everyday readers have been annotating in books since at least the invention of the book itself. Writing the margin makes us better readers, more attentive, more understanding, more active, more critical. But as books and other assigned readings move online, we lose the ability to practice this essential learning skill. This is what annotation looks like today, thanks to Hypothesis. Hypothesis brings back the margins to reading online, but it does much more. Not only have we brought annotation to digital text, we're leveraging some of the greatest affordances of the digital environment to bring annotation into the 21st century. Any website, article, ebook, can have multiple layers of annotation. The traditional private notes of analog annotation, but also various social layers, a layer of public commentary, private reading and annotating groups for my peers, perhaps my colleagues in a department teaching the same text, private course groups for each of my classes. I might teach the same reading in several courses, but I'd have different layers for each one. So what does it look like in the classroom? We've gotten amazing feedback from our instructor users over the years about why they find hypothesis to be so transformative in their practice. And here's just a brief distillation of that feedback. I'm sure many of you who teach have wondered before whether your students have even done the reading that you've assigned. You stare into their eyes when, they, when you meet in class and sort of trying to decipher whether the reading has actually been done or they're faking it. Well, one of the oft repeated testimonials from our professors using hypothesis is that collaborative annotation lets them know that students have done the reading. There's a trace of their students' presence in the text in annotation. And this isn't just a matter of making sure that students do the reading. It's about seeing how they've done the reading, where students were confused, where they were excited, and enabling teachers to be present for those moments and intervene with and inspire students more effectively. 
Now again, annotation has always been a vehicle for active reading, that's nothing new. But the need for this kind of deeper engagement has never been more urgent. As reading moves online, studies have shown that students get easily distracted and less engaged, or less engaged. They skim rather than read closely. Annotation has been shown to counteract that trend, reinstilling and invigorating critical reading practices for the digital age. And as I think has become clear, one of the new affordances of annotation online is that it's social. We're not reading the text alone anymore. If we're confused, we can ask for help from classmates and from instructors. We can have conversations that help us more deeply engage and extend the course material. I honestly can't say it better than this student who was inspired to blog about her experience with Hypothesis in the classroom. Hypothesis is my literary Facebook. When I'm reading, I sometimes wonder, does anyone actually understand this? Am I crazy? With this brilliant tool, I know I'm not alone. So annotation, close active reading, these practices have improved to have positive effects on learning outcomes. But hypothesis is valuable beyond the understood importance of marginal note taking. Students that are annotating together are collaborating deeply, learning to work together to comprehend information and create knowledge in ways that can be applied beyond reading the course material. And all of this work that they're doing, all this knowledge that they're creating is collected in a kind of dynamic portfolio that follows them from course to course and can be mined at different points in their academic careers and beyond. But one of the things that makes me so proud to work at Hypothesis is that we've built an awesome ed tech tool, but we're, what we're doing is much bigger than ed tech. Not only can students carry their notes with them from course to course and beyond campus, but they carry the practice of annotation with them into the real world. They've learned to become engaged readers and thinkers, knowledge producers, collaborators. These skills are essential in everyday life for a healthy democratic society. All right. What does it look like in Canvas? Well, we launched our LMS app in December of last year and the response has been incredible. Those of you that have been using Hypothesis in their teaching for a while now, asking students to sign up for accounts, download the browser extension, join a private group, will quickly see how seamless the onboarding process has become through the Canvas LMS. Thanks to LTI, students and instructors can get straight to the important work of commenting on and discussing course readings in their margins. So for those of you that are new to Hypothesis, I'll briefly walk through the basics. The Hypothesis app in Canvas enables you to activate Hypothesis annotation on select readings. When Hypothesis is active on a document, you can simply select text to create an annotation. You can reply to existing annotations to start a discussion thread. One way to think about collaborative annotation with Hypothesis is as a replacement for the traditional discussion forum, moving those conversations back into the text, uh, to the context, onto the text and into the context of course material. Any number of threaded conversations can begin with both instructor and student created comments in the margins of a reading. And all this is done with private groups connected to specific courses and rosters through LTI. So these conversations are private and are in a safe space for students to share their ideas. Now what's coming? Well, based on feedback from beta testers and early adopters, we've identified four specific areas for development in the near future. First, speed grader integration, so that instructors can more easily assess student annotations. Sectioning of, course roster, of the course roster into smaller groups in order to annotate the same text separately. For example, if you're teaching Shakespeare's sonnets to an intro lit course, survey intro lit course, you can't have two students uh, annotate in a 14 line poem. Student annotation portfolios to better surface student annotations across courses and allow students to export their annotations for various purposes, like export set of annotations into some other document to begin the composition of, say, a paper. And learning analytics, the data of annotation captured in the caliper format so that students, instructors, and administrators can leverage it to improve teaching, learning, and broader connected concerns in higher learning, higher education, like success and retention. And I am absolutely thrilled to be able to announce that we have uh, released the speed grader integration this week uh, in time for the fall semester, thanks to a lot of hard work from especially the hypothesis designers and developers. So uh, canned applause for, uh, well, real applause, I'm sure, if there was a way to capture all the applause from the participants here who are all muted. But um, big thank you to the team at Hypothesis for delivering this in time for the semester. This is, again, the number one uh, Thing that, that folks have, have asked for. So let's go ahead and take a look. Have I successfully switched my view here to uh, thumbs up? Okay. Um, so here, of course, you're seeing something familiar. It's a Canvas course shell. This is a Literature 404 course. You can see my week one readings there are on poetry. And this is a hypothesis assignment. 
It's Mary Oliver's poem, Wild Geese. It opens and it has the hypothesis sidebar pop out like that and the annotations are present. So I can click on a single annotation and see that. I can expand it. In this case, students made a comment. The professor has replied and asked for clarification or development and the student has done that. Um, and students have also started their own threads in other places. And hey, Jeremy, um, there's a couple of requests. I wonder if you could zoom in a little bit. I don't know if you can do that on your you know what, I, what I'm going to do is actually tell this assignment to open in a new tab, which might give it some more real estate. So let me know if that solves the problem. Um, it's another step, but in some cases, I, I especially highly recommend this for PDFs because then you uh, um, preserve some of the real estate. Is that better? Yeah, there we go. Okay, so we see the annotation sidebar pop out. It can be closed and opened. I can actually hide the annotations if I desire. Um, I can zoom in on a particular comment. Um, and this is hypothesis in the context of a document, but I may want to view uh, these student in, uh, annotations separately in SpeedGrader. And since this is an assignment, I can do that. So I'll go to SpeedGrader. And the same poem will pop up. But this time, the, the sidebar is filtered by individual students. In this case, I'm grading model students' work. Um, and he or she has done great. They've created four annotations. I can expand this one. It's part of a, a deeper thread. See what's going on there. And I can uh, grade the assignment. So what do you guys think? I think this is definitely complete. Um, and I'm just very happy with her work here. So I'm just going to say great work. I don't have any particular feedback. Um, and I've already graded uh, some of the other work. Teacher's pet has uh, already gotten the completion grade and has a piece of feedback waiting for them. And class clown, as the name would suggest, has not done the, her, or his or her assignment here. And so no annotations appear. So this is all just sort of making it easier for me to see uh, this conversation um, uh, more specifically based on student contributions and assess them or just provide feedback on their annotations. Um, Let's go back to uh, front page. We can also see PDFs open in the same way. So here's a PDF of Toni Morrison's uh, 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 excerpt from Bluest Eye. The Bluest Eye, you can see annotations can contain images. Um, you can edit annotations, trash them, or create re replies. So I could um, you know, offer a response because uh, you know, model student and teacher's pet have already been getting into what's going on in the uh, strange uh, sort of deformation of, of, the, of the Dick and Jane book that opens uh, the bluest eye. And again, I can view this uh, in speed grader. And of course I can adjust the, the grading of this to be, uh, to be not graded, to be pass fail or incomplete complete, or in this case, this assignment, because I thought it was a, a chapter of a book might be more uh, out of out of, uh, just gonna refresh you to make sure that populates. Um, might be out of 10 since it's a longer, a longer text. So here are teacher's pets annotations and I'm gonna give him a seven out of 10. And then finally, I just wanna show you quickly how um, to create these, the workflow for creating these, uh, either a module that's not graded or an assignment that is graded. I want to add, I'm going to add a, uh, uh, an item to the, to the Tony Morrison week um, and go to external tool and choose hypothesis. And this is the, the, the stage at which I select a text for annotation. I can use a public URL like that Mary Oliver poem, uh, a PDF from my Canvas files or a PDF from Google Drive. This third option is really uh, not as often used with the Canvas LMS. It's what we provide the other LMSs, but we have a deeper integration with Canvas where we can work with the file repository. I can open up and see all the files that are in that file repository, and I'll add the Jerome Bump um, article on, on, uh, on Tony Morrison. And I will tell this to load a new tab because it's a PDF and I want to have that real estate get rid of Canvas just for the moment to have real estate for the PDF and for the annotation pane.
And there you go. It's your own bump. Racism and appearance in the bluest eye. Ready for annotation. So that's hypothesis in Canvas in a nutshell, as it were. I'm sure there are questions. I'm sure you are eager to, to test it yourself. I'll be giving a link to install the app in, in, just, a, in, a, in just a little bit. But let me jump back to my presentation here um, and just say a few things about the speed grader integration. Again, the speed grader integration has been the number one feature request from instructors since we launched the LMS app. Um, for, those who chose to assess, for those who choose to assess student annotations, this is gonna make the workflow a lot easier. I'm really looking forward to the kinds of rubrics that teachers create for annotation assignments. I think we're opening up a whole new area of learning for attention here. It's less important to me that we can put a grade on it, but that we can give this work better attention, help students become better thinkers and writers, and perhaps one of the most critical moments of learning, reading. And keep in mind that a hypothesis assignment doesn't need to be graded. You can leverage the speed grader integration just to be able to offer private feedback to students on the process of reading, analyzing, and discussing course content. For example, class clown may be doing some stuff. I don't want to call them out publicly in an annotation. The, the, the private feedback of speed grader would allow me to help get uh, class clown back on the right track. All right, I'm gonna say just a brief word about the hypothesis pilot program that accompanies the uh, LMS app launch, um, and then we'll, we'll, we'll move on to our round table. So I think I'm doing good with time here. Um, over the past six months, since we launched the hypothesis LMS app, we designed a pilot program that helps student, uh, schools explore the value of collaborative annotation and evaluate hypothesis tools and services for adoption by their institution. We already have a number of schools who've decided to pilot this fall. We're expecting many more to sign up in these last few weeks of summer. Uh, the plurality of these are, are Canvas schools, but there are, uh, we do, uh, it is an LTI app, so it operates in other uh, LMSs as well. Uh, and I want to thank these institutions and folks running the pilots uh, on their campuses. They've been true partners in designing the, the program itself and have helped inform a lot of the important product decisions we've made over the last six months. A key piece of the pilot is the idea that we want to collaborate with our partners in higher ed as peers. Many of us at Hypothesis are educators and scholars by training. We want to work together with you to co-design pilots that make sense on the ground on your campus uh, and support innovative uses of collaborative annotation uh, in the classroom. Of course, we provide the kind of high-touch customer support for technical issues as well. As, me as I mentioned, we have several staff members, including engineers with backgrounds in education, who are very familiar with uh, various learning management systems and how they integrate uh, third-party apps. So they are prepared to, to help troubleshoot. We've tried to organize the pod as a community of practitioners interested in sharing and building on each other's experiences. And that's the idea behind our Annotate Ed events, which some of you may be familiar with. We host these on campuses, but also co-located with major technology and professional conferences throughout the year. And they're really a chance for the annotation and education community to come together, um, talk about hypothesis and the product roadmap, beta test features, offer feedback, uh, on the roadmap, just uh, talk about new use cases and features for annotation, share best practices for implementation, and uh, conduct research together on the efficacy of various applications of annotation in education. So if all this is, uh, sounds exciting to you, I encourage you to move forward with getting a fall pilot at your school. Uh, we've tried to make it so that Hypothesis shoulders a lot of the necessary work in the pilot. It's meant to be lightweight um, and, and keep the ask on schools minimal. Uh, we really just want a cohort and for you to try to help us uh, get, work with teachers closely to explore annotation as a teaching tool. Um, we want to make it as easy as possible for you to start exploring the power of annotation for teaching and learning. And so down there, there's a link that you can begin with the installation process today and I'll surface that later. But again, this, uh, this deck can be downloaded through bit.ly um, by going to bit.ly hype in can, H-Y-P-I-N-C-A-N. All right, you've heard enough of me. I think I really did keep that to 20 minutes. I'm very proud of myself. And we have a lot of time to hear from practitioners, which is uh, far more interesting, I think, uh, far more compelling. So let's, or not to put too much pressure on you guys, but, um, but I'm, I'm looking forward to this conversation. Um, so let's hear from some teachers who've used Hypothesis in their courses. Um, you can see their bios here. We have with us Julia Cantor from CU Denver, Lorna Gonzalez from Cal State Channel Islands, Megan Kennedy from Florida State, and Spencer Greenhall from University of Kentucky, and they've all appropriately waved, so you know who's who. Oh, I guess they have their names there too. Uh, and you have their bios here, so I'm not gonna go off on the bios uh, too much. Uh, I'm gonna let each of the panelists introduce themselves by sharing a quick overview 
of how they use annotation uh, in their courses. And just to be surprising, I'm going to go and from my right to left, starting with Megan, then Spencer, then Lorna, then Julia, and then I'll switch the order up to keep you guys on your toes for the next prompt. But so just, you know, start by telling us a little about how you've used Hypothesis in your courses and Megan, if you wouldn't mind starting. Okay, sure. Um, I, uh, I use Hypothesis in a large uh, online course. It's an asynchronous online course on literature and medicine. Uh, there's currently, uh, usually when I teach it, about 120 students, um, usually with a couple of TAs. And I use Hypothesis for what I call primary source workshops. So at the end of each unit, um, I have the students look at a primary source text and we annotate the text together. Um, at the beginning of the course, it's the text that we've looked at already. And by the end of the course, it's texts that are new to them so that they can take skills that they've learned during the semester and bring them to bear on a text that they haven't seen before. Um, and uh, whether it's a short story, an essay, a poem, a uh, collection of poems. And then at the end of the semester, students choose two out of those annotations is um, taking into account my comment, the comments from their colleagues, their peers in class from the annotation software, uh, and they reflect on the revision process. And I've been really happy with how it's worked. So. Hi everyone, I'm Spencer Greenhall. I teach in the Information Communication Technology and Library Science programs at the University of Kentucky. Um, my background is in educational technology. That's what my PhD is in. And uh, I was really fortunate while I was doing my graduate work to uh, teach in a really well-structured and very creative online program, a Master's of Arts in Educational Technology. And that, uh, it, it, it was great. You know, it, it tried to avoid um, rote online assignments and tried to really break the mold of, of what online teaching looked like. And so when I was then done with my graduate studies and designing my own online courses, I really wanted to find a way to, to bring some of that in. And I'd heard about a hypothesis a lot over the past couple, uh, a, a lot over the course of my graduate studies. And so over the past year, um, during my first year as faculty member here at UK, I've been bringing it in um, as a way to uh, add some extra interactivity and especially interactivity around texts in the class that I teach. So uh, primarily what I do is I use, uh, I, I use hypothesis as sort of a participation activity to help ensure that students are reading the text, but also give them a chance to uh, ask questions and, uh, and comment on the text and, and have sort of, you know, a lot of online courses have discussion post style assignments. But what I really appreciate about hypothesis is it moves that and contextualizes that within a text so that it's happening as you are reading and not as something that happens afterward. And then also something that I found really helpful is to annotate the text myself before I even assign them to the students. Uh, that way, if I'm assigning a text that I think is valuable, but I don't entirely agree with everything, I can be upfront about the students about where I push back against the text and then give them permission to do the same thing. And then I can also call their attention to the parts of the text that I think are most important uh, and where I hope they'll take um, the most ideas from as they move forward in the class. Um, hello, uh, I teach a course um, called Literacy in the Disciplines, and it's also been called Literacy Across Content Areas. And so I have students from different disciplines um, centralized in my course. And one of the primary goals is to teach them the idea that different disciplines have different ways of thinking and doing and practicing. And um, we do a lot of um, text analysis to sort of reveal some of those differences. And um, the way that um, Hypothesis has helped with that and collaborative annotation is um, I can have, I've, I've had students from uh, like history and English working on the same document like um, Sojourner Truth speech, Ain't I a Woman? And they're asking different, the assignment is maybe to ask questions that are um, typical to your discipline. And, um, and history focused students will ask um, particular types of questions like political and economic forces at play. And then the English literature folks will ask um, um, questions about literary devices and rhetorical devices and that sort of thing. And the same has been true with my um, science and math 
uh, students who will be looking at a common text, including a graph or um, a chart, and asking dis disciplinary questions there. So it's been neat for them to identify the boundaries of their own disciplines by collaboratively annotating the same document. And then just one other thing, um, I'm also an instructional designer for teaching and learning innovations at Cal State Channel Islands, and we use collaborative annotation in our own work with each other um, because we're producing a lot of multimedia documents and web-based documents, and um, we're able to send each other drafts of our work and, um, and provide annotations in context rather than just in note form, maybe on a Google Doc elsewhere. Cool. And I do want to just point out that Lorna is part of the pilot at, at CSU uh, Channel Islands. So she represents our pilot. Or really, the first pilot I think that we signed was with CSU Channel Islands, which I was super proud of. They do some innovative work there. Sorry, Julia. <laughs> no, that's fine. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Julia Cantor. Um, uh, I work at CU Denver in the School of Education and Human Development. And um, the, I taught a summer course on the culture of education policy and use hypothesis throughout the course just to have students annotate the articles every week. Um, I didn't do every article every week. I wanted to give them sort of some spaces to have articles on their own without the hypothesis annotation, but then they would do one or two per week. Um, and various reasons why I started using hypothesis, um, mostly because I, I really do not like the threaded discussion option, <laughs> um, to be honest, in a lot of the in Canvas and a lot of the LMSs. And I thought this was a, a really nice replacement um, in many ways. Um, I really want to keep community at the center of my classes. And I feel like in a lot of online classes, including my own in the past, we can lose community really quickly. Um, and this, this tends to bring students together um, you know, bring them together every week um, prior to having any sort of Zoom discussions that, that we would have together. Um, the other reason why I use it is just for formative assessment purposes. It was really nice for my instructor, my co-instructor and I to go in and look at what people were, were thinking and, and doing with the text. And then if we were to have a Zoom discussion with them that week, we'd say, hey, let's go back to this one spot. You all were really wrestling with this or kind of um, start to, you know, analyze it a little bit more deeply. Um, so it's, it's sort of a new platform for me to start using, but the students really enjoyed it. And I think um, it, um, it really sort of set a new dimension for the course for me this, this year. Thanks, Julia. And you, did you mention that you have participated in marginal syllabus? Yeah, I have. Okay. So yes. yeah, uh, one of the things I love about Hypothesis, and, and I'm an annotation geek too, I annotate the newspaper every morning, but uh, you know, Julia and Lorna mentioned that they've annotated, you know, as part of professional practice, it's not just sort of an activity to, to send to students, but it can it spans a lot of you know uh, areas of professional academic practice. Um, great. I just want to I'm going to do a surprise quiz really quickly for you guys. Uh, I mean, we sent some questions ahead of time, but I just want to quickly check in. So unmute yourselves for just a second and tell me about the the class size of the course that you taught, starting with Julia. Um, I think I had 17 students this summer. Lorna. Um, I typically have between 20 and 30 students. Spencer, yours was uh, a big class. Uh, 20 to 25. Okay. And then Megan, yours was huge, right? Yeah, my, mine is huge. The first time I taught it, it was 60, which is big. And then the last couple of times, it's been a, 120. I do have TAs, but um, I like to monitor. Um, I like to monitor what's going on myself anyway. So it's right. still... It's, it's still a lot to keep track of. And you and I, I notice in the chat, somebody is asking about annotation groups. And that is something, um, the annotations can kind of stack up when it's a smaller um, piece, but I got around that by offering sort of three different options for annotation some weeks um, or, um, or just a longer text. And then they kind of, they just kind of naturally stretched out by interest. So it, it worked out okay. Great, and I think, yeah, that's, a, that's a something that I mentioned in the coming features we're planning to address is being able to section things so that that 100 person Shakespeare course could be five groups of 20 on, on a sonnet so that it doesn't get too noisy. That might actually be too noisy, 20 people on a 14 line poem, but you know, you'd be able to slice, it, uh, slice the group up, group up however you saw fit. Um, so that's something that's coming, but something that we have released, as I said, I was excited, and I know Megan, uh, with a number of you, Lorna at least, I, I've talked about the speed grader 
idea. It's a, something that clearly was requested by users. Let's go in the same order as we did before with Megan first, because I know, you know, what are you looking forward in terms of speed grader and how you might leverage that? I know it just came out and you just saw the, the demo, but uh, why have you needed that kind of feature and what, what you know, what, what do you think you can use it for? Oh, um, I think for me, it, I'm really glad you did this. Um, for me, I offer the students the option of doing five out of the six annotations. So one of the issues for me is that um, for, and also, as I just said, in a particular unit, I might offer them a choice of three different texts that they could, they could choose um, so that I pull, up, um, I pull up a hypothesis text and then it's not like all 120 students have annotated it. I can't just run down and grade each one and transfer it over, but I have to kind of do a complicated search and then click over to Canvas and do a search in the speed grader. And it's this incredibly complicated seven step process. Um, <laughs> but now with the speed grader, it's just gonna be so much easier um, because it, I'll be able to just grade right in the speed grader the students who have used that particular annotation option. So I'm really looking forward to it. Great, let's go down the line again. Spencer, Lorna, Julie, in that order, do you have thoughts about the speed grader functionality at this point? So uh, I'm a little bit of an idealist and I like to think that I can create activities for my online students to do uh, without them being graded and that all of my students will just jump in head first and really participate. And I've unfortunately found that that it isn't always the case. Uh, in fact, in one of the courses that I taught last spring, uh, someone in the teacher course evaluations I got at the end of the semester, one of my students mentioned really appreciating the hypothesis integration, but wishing that more of her classmates actually did it along with her. And so that got me really thinking, okay, I, I need a way of um, encouraging people to do that. And I, I don't like necessarily the carrot and stick approach to assessment that we do a lot of the times, but sometimes it's just necessary. And so uh, I need a way to, to be able to keep track of if my students are going to uh, if they will be annotating and it's not going to be a huge part of their grade and uh, I don't know that I'm that interested in how much they're writing and necessarily the quality of uh, what they're doing. My, my focus on assessment in that course is just in other areas, but I do want to carve out um, a part of the overall grade for the class to make sure that, uh, that there is participation in this community and that there are conversation going on. And so as much as I dislike carrot and stick assessments, that's, that's just what it's going to be. Right. You also mentioned though, uh, annotating along with students, which in my experience is, is, is inspire students to, to join the conversation. They see that you're doing it and they really will uh, sometimes reciprocate. Um, and the other thing is, I wonder if I'm echoing or if that's somebody else, but um, the other thing I'm, I'm wondering is, um, if just the feedback alone, the fact that there's a private feedback channel so they know that a teacher is going to be able to give them some feedback on what they did is another way to inspire them to, to join. Absolutely. Thank you. Lorna? Uh, yeah. So um, before the speed grader, um, the types of assignments that I would give with annotations were engagement activities and they were informal formative assessments. And so they were not really graded or they were just graded for completion. Um, and then when it came time to a, give students a grade, they would actually submit a separate assignment in Canvas, which was a copy of the text and then a list of their annotations or their questions. And um, sometimes I was teaching a style of questioning, so they'd submit their questions on a separate document. And so with this um, speed grader, I'm really excited because um, this will allow for a more authentic submission, uh, assignment submission that I'll be able to see their annotations and their questions in context for this particular assignment. And then there's another course I used to teach where I could see this being um, incredibly useful because when students would do peer review, um, I would ask that the feedback they gave each other incorporated um, certain language we were working on. So in this case, it was a multimedia writing course and um, they were learning about um, principles of design. And so in the feedback they were giving their colleagues on their in progress multimedia designs, I'd want to see um, that they were using the language of design, including contrast, repetition, that kind of thing. And I would have a rubric for evaluating their feedback to each other. And so um, 
I could see the speed grader as being a great opportunity to um, attach a rubric to, you know, evaluate their or give them some feedback on the feedback they're giving their colleagues on that type of an assignment, if that makes sense. Oh, you're muted, Jeremy. Thanks. One of the things I hope to uh, put into practice once uh, once this is launched and we start to get some actual use of the of the tool is to to collect rubrics if if teachers are willing to to share them and have a kind of rubric bank for that purpose. Um, we, we already have been asked that question, and I'd love to sort of develop that. But I love that idea of the rubric being kind of disciplinary specific, looking for certain ways of uh, responding and then uh, evaluating the student work there. I mean, the number of different kinds of things that we can suddenly focus in on here, different practices and skills that we're trying to encourage in our students, I think is, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm just so excited to be able to, to see this stuff and hear how teachers are going to zoom in there and work with students on cultivating certain skills. Sorry to interject, Julia. That's okay, no worries. Um, yeah, I think it's similar to what Spencer and a little bit what you were saying, Jeremy. I'm, I'm trying to get away from grading as much as possible, um, but I do appreciate the sort of the privacy aspect of giving, you know, someone some feedback on their annotation. And I'll probably just use like the complete and complete option in Canvas and not give any points or grades. Um, I don't feel great about sort of doing that with how students discuss or sort of meet a text. Um, giving them a grade for that, um, but I, in the summer, there were a couple folks where they they're an, they just weren't annotating each week, or it was pretty light, and so it would have been really nice to give them some pretty direct feedback um, in Canvas. I love that spectrum of different ways it might get used. Um, so the final prompt that we have is just, you know, what's next for your teaching and annotation? Um, assignment ideas, new features you want, <laughs> but we just launched a big one. Uh, research you'd like to conduct, something else. This is really, take that question however you want. Um, this will be uh, your final sort of open word and then we'll uh, open the floor up to, looks like there's been quite a lot of questions that hopefully you guys can answer. <laughs> And I guess we'll just keep going in the same order, Megan, because I know you're, oh, okay. you're, the, you're the expert here. You've been doing this for a long time. I, I don't know if it's been tweeted out, but Megan has a great article on hypothesis in a journal of Victorian literature. That's, uh, I would recommend it, re, uh, reading it for, uh, even if you're not an, an, a literary professor, but it's a great, great piece on engagement and hypothesis. But we're going to rely on you to start the thread again, Megan. <laughs> okay, Th thank you. Um, the, the article is actually a little bit, uh, out of date now because you've been doing so much development to the program, which I really appreciate because uh, I, I talk about the on-ramp issue, which a lot of that has been really eliminated with the LMS option, which, which is great. Um, one of the things that I think would be super to see more of uh, with hypothesis or really any annotation program, but hypothesis makes it so easy, uh, would be more use of this kind of um, work to um, with like journals, like when a, a, a journal puts out a, a new issue to open out, you know, maybe one of the articles in the issue for um, public annotation, or if it's, you know, the 200th anniversary of uh, somebody's birth, some author's birth, put out, you know, a, a, a one of their novels and have kind of a a worldwide annotation of that novel. I mean, something kind of fun like that, um, I think would be just a lot, a lot of fun to do and people could get their classes involved with it, which would be a great way of helping students feel like they're involved in something beyond just the walls of the classroom, so. I love it, we'll make it happen. Spencer? So I, I'm pretty new to uh, hypothesis. I'm on the other end of Megan. The other end than Megan, but I, so I do a fair amount of uh, social media research. I'm interested in learning communities in places like Twitter and especially the data they produce and what we can learn about meaning and about learning in those spaces because of it. And so as I've been listening to this webinar, uh, I'd be interested in starting to, to do something similar with uh, an annotating community to see if it's possible, and I don't know whether it is or not, I'm uh, very new to this, it, possible to, to collect this data in a way that it would be interesting to talk about um, how communities form and how people interact with each other. I've been doing a lot of this work with platforms like Twitter. It Hypothesis seems like a great next step to go in, especially if it's something that I'm already uh, using in my teaching. So that's an area that I am interested in exploring. 
That's great. That's something I'm super interested in, Spencer. So let's follow up on that. I mean, I hope that the, you know, the, 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 the speed grainer integration is really just the first of what will be many ways that we allow students, teachers, and administrators to see what's going on with annotation, mm. um, what's, what's happening. I mean, social network theory applied to how students are annotating and responding. I mean, you really can learn quite a bit uh, from, you know, the, the, the archive of annotations a course can make. Um, and we want to make that more visible. And there's folks like Remy Collier and the Crowd Layers Project that are doing that with our open API. And there's lots of room to do, to do more of it. So I think that's a really cool project, both inside the classroom and outside the classroom. So we can take some of that Twitter and uh, you know, um, tr strategy and apply it to annotation. That's awesome. Um, well, I continue to be interested in um, you know, using annotations in the courses that I teach. And I also mentioned that um, we in, at Teaching and Learning Innovations at California State University Channel Islands use hypothesis in the work that we do. And um, a colleague and I were recently doing a little bit of research for some writing that we're doing and um, looking on different university websites at, at different texts. And we used hypothesis to save our annotations. And one thing I appreciate about that is um, in addition to the archive, of annotations um, and sources of those kind. Um, you know, websites have hyperlinks to other places and um, the hypothesis interface would follow me as I would click on a link and be redirected to a new page. And so I could go back to the annotations and not have to worry that, oh, I had jumped to a new page or a new website and, you know, was that going to be broken somehow? So it was useful in our, in that sort of research that we were doing as well. And also as part of this pilot, um, I got to hear how other faculty um, at our school um, were using hypothesis and um, one person used it in her course um, to have students annotate the learning objectives and instructions for an assignment she had given. So it was a great way for students to just um, make sense of the assignment and ask questions um, publicly, you know, before um, embarking on that task. And, um, and it was a different way of doing it than having them do the discussion forum. And I always appreciate any opportunity to have students actually do something with the learning objectives when they're, you know, housed on a, a module or, or an assignment page and, and not just skim by them and move on. Yeah, no, that's amazing. And uh, this reminds me to remind everybody that although I'm, you know, very excited about the speed grader integration, hypothesis can be integrated into the LMS without it being a formal assignment or a line in the grade book, right? You can add it to a module. So you can upload a syllabus or you can upload wherever those learning objectives are. And, uh, and that can be annotatable and it cannot be for a grade. It can just be for the meta conversation that might inform you know, co-curricular co design with your students um, and feedback on things like your syllabus or clarification on things like your syllabus. So that's great. Yeah, and I, I mentioned this in the in the chat really early on in the webinar, but um, this past summer I invited an author of one of the texts to join us in the annotation. Um, she happened to be a professor at um, CU Denver, so it was rather easy to kind of just get her into my canvas um shell as like a collaborator or a ta or something like that um but it did add this extra layer of authenticity for my students um as they discussed and as she kind of went back and forth with them throughout the week so um i just want to do that more invite more authors folks i don't even know and just kind of reach out to them and see if they will join us logistically i don't totally know how that will work if they're not in the same university system getting them into canvas maybe jeremy you can speak to that um, but that's something I'm really interested in keeping and starting to do more. Yeah, well, let's then make that the first question. I think we're going to uh, thank you guys so much for sharing your experiences and stories and for using the app and for using the app for as long as you have, Megan, because as you said, the onboarding has become a lot easier. But um, it's really folks like you that push through the, the difficulty of getting started <laughs> with a big group of people in annotation that uh, kept me around, kept us around in the education space. And I think we're, we're now very focused on making it a lot easier and building tools to make it uh, more effective for your teaching. So to answer your question, Julia, it's pretty hard to get somebody added to a, from outside an LMS to, uh, as a you know, visitor in an LMS um, environment. I, I've gotten that privilege a number of times because I'm helping with integration. So it is possible, it probably depends on the institution, but it would be burdensome to, to do that. 
Of course, you can do that outside the LMS with Hypothesis uh, easily because you're, everybody sort of owns their own account and, um, and it would just be a matter of sharing a text as like a marginal syllabus. So, um, but I love that idea. Uh, so I am going to say it's time. We've got about 12 minutes left here, maybe 14 since we started a little bit late um, to open it up for questions. And so I'm hoping that my colleague, Nate Angel, um, has been monitoring the chat and can surface some of those questions because I have been ignoring it, trying to focus on my presentation and, and my colleagues here. Um, yeah, Jeremy, there's been a really vibrant discussion in chat and uh, Caitlin and I and some other folks who have all been uh, talking a lot there. Um, but I'd like to actually turn to a couple of questions that have come up both in the Q&A tool and in chat. So one is about accessibility. And so um, there's a lot to say about it and I wonder, um, Jeremy, if you might take a, a first stab at just describing the current state of accessibility at Hypothesis. I've shared yeah. out the accessibility web page that we have in the chat, so people may get that, and it will be in your follow-up email as well. But then maybe the panelists also have things to remark on that. Sure, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about the state of things at Hypothesis first. Um, that accessibility page that you were linked to um, is a really wonderful resource, and it's actually especially thanks to Caitlin and Nate that it's there. We have an internal accessibility task force that's been for the past year focused on accessibility. We published a VPAT. We are not uh, WCAG compliant yet, um, but based on the VPAT, uh, Caitlin and, and Arthi, some folks internally have created a really robust uh, roadmap that outlines what we need to do to become WCAG AA compliant. Um, and then we've committed to becoming WCAG AA compliant by January 1. Um, so what are, and I just see now that I have the chat open, what are the least successful areas of the tool? I mean, my understanding is that a screen reader can, um, if you're going in terms of screen reading, you can get a screen reader to read a text and, and read the annotation pane. I don't know, I don't think it's as efficient as it should be in terms of how um, the order of operations of how certain text is read out um, in, the, in the right order. So my understanding, at least on the first level, is that there's some, it's not the most, it's not the most um, efficient experience to, to have the readout of the text um, with annotations. But um, uh, the other problem is the creation of annotation, um, being able to select text with uh, keystrokes uh, and things like that. So we did have a presentation at our annual conference that pointed us in the right direction for that. So again, we're very committed to tackling these, uh, these uh, the accessibility issue um, over the next uh, you know, four months. And I am working with some folks um, actually uh, at Ohio State and I need to get back to somebody at, uh, um, at another school that's that, and I'm trying to put together a little working group of practitioners to think through what accommodations we can make to uh, students. Um, make, make, make for students that, 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 uh, that can access the tool uh, in the straight, in the, you know, the straightforward way to, to try to create some ways that they can still participate and uh, we'll see what we come up with. But I'll, I'll share that when it's ready. Um, I don't know if the panelists have anything to say about accessibility or Nate, who uh, knows a lot about accessibility, wants to add anything to that. Did any of you panelists have any accessibility points or experience you wanted to share? No, <laughs> sorry, we won't put you on the spot. Um, so yeah, we have just, so uh, just to add another point there, we've been working extensively with um, uh, a, a great group at OCAD uh, in, uh, in Canada um, on accessibility. We've had a full accessibility review. It's been able to identify, um, you know, where, where the weaknesses and, and uh, all uh, victories already are. And so, uh, as Jeremy said, the roadmap is, is set up and we're really committed to uh, finalizing it. The most complicated part of, of uh, accessibility is actually in the creation of annotations, as Jeremy was talking about. So that's, um, that's kind of the last mile that we're, we're really focused on. You know, there's another whole topic area that um, people have been really interested in, Jeremy, um, and that's around the cost. And so <laughs> people are thinking about, okay, how do I get started with this? Um, annotation at my institution with hypothesis and uh, what's going to cost. Um, and so you might also want to talk about the pilot program a little bit. Sure. So the, the web-based browser extension uh, and hypothesis accounts to, to leverage that tool are all free. It's all open source. It's always going to be that way. There's a way to use hypothesis in your daily life. 
and a way to use it in your courses, as Megan knows, um, using that browser extension um, that, that can be burdensome. And, uh, and we've streamlined that process um, and we're adding specific features for the education uh, space. Um, and that is going to be part of a, pay, uh, a paid tool. Um, so the LMS tool is we do expect it to be a paid product uh, ultimately, we have made it easy to install so you can install it and, and test it and vet it in the ways that schools need to vet it um, and even run it in a course uh, for a semester for, with less than 50 students for free. But we do expect students to, um, sorry, we do expect institutions to move into a formal pilot uh, at some point um, and then roll it out uh, more broadly to get uh, the feedback from their users um, and the feedback to us about the efficacy of the tool. And then after a pilot term, uh, we will negotiate licenses for, uh, uh, for, for with, with schools. I'm not going to talk about prices uh, online here, but if you follow up, we can uh, have um, you know, more detailed discussion about what happens after a pilot. Great. Uh, so if, if people have, um, more specific questions about that, feel free to, to add them now. Um, also, if you will, I'll put this in the chat, but if you email us at education at hypothesis um, with any kind of questions um, you might have, or just uh, you can, we shared links today that can actually help you start the process. Um, and and, and there, there are links in the, um, in the, uh, in the document, uh, in, the, in this, in this, well, you can go to hypothesis slash education and get this stuff, but also this is a link to a, a brief about the pilot and what we provide. Um, and then this is a link to uh, go ahead and install the app. So uh, you can see a little bit about what the pilot provides, although I guess I, I went through that in pretty, pretty good detail. Great, you know, there's, um, folks have also been kind of, um, there's been a series of different kind of questions around kind of what kind of documents can be annotated in Canvas. And so there's questions, you know, about, you know, PDFs and, you know, what's the Google Drive integration and are Canvas, Canvas pages themselves annotatable and what about student submissions and what, it, you know, how does it work in, uh, in conjunction with the commenting feature in Gradebook or the SpeedGrader and so forth. And so I'm wondering if there's a quick way for you to either summarize and or kind of show off um, maybe even setting up an assignment. Yeah, I showed setting up an assignment uh, earlier, um, but I can bring it up real quickly again and show you the, the options um, so that you have them in front of you and we can pause there. But this is what it looks like for generating an assignment. Um, you can grab a public URL, uh, which could be a Canvas page if it's a public Canvas page, but not if it requires a login. Um, a PDF from the Canvas files, a note that PDFs need to be uh, OCR'd, you know, some, some copies of books, for example, or just images. And so the text would need to be recognizable on top of the PDF, which, you know, most copy machines and most journal articles are today um, or allow. Um, or you can get it from Google Drive. I don't know if there's a, if you're, I mean, this is really preference the last two. If you want to keep some PDFs in Google Drive or keep your PDFs in the Canvas files for the course, that's, that's your choice. You have both options here. I will say that through the Google Drive integration, you can immediately upload something. Um, so rather than grabbing a text and putting a PDF and putting it into Canvas files and then going to assignment and creating an assignment you, through the Google Drive workflow, you could immediately um, just drag an article from a, a PDF from your, from your drive. Um, so it's PDFs and web pages uh, for now, but that's just the beginning. Um, we all know that annotation means a lot of different things and can be applied in a lot of different ways, right? Peer review is annotation. Student teacher feedback on a paper uh, is annotation. Uh, there are other types of texts that are shared readings that are not, uh, you know, present here, but we're working with journal aggregators, we're working with publishers to bring annotation in uh, and hypothesis into the LMS uh, through those means. Um, and I, we're in conversation with some of the LMS companies about where else annotation is useful. I believe it's useful, you know, my, my sort of jam, as it were, um, is the in, in, uh, inline discussion of shared readings. But we could use hypothesis on top of uh, student papers for teacher feedback in a one-to-one -one group, right? That's a private group between student and teacher. We could use hypothesis for peer review. Um, we could use hypothesis in these other contexts. And I think, you know, the vision there is then you'd have all your notes and feedback and discussions in a single tool to harvest in different ways, which I think is incredibly powerful um, idea for, for education moving forward. 
Great. You know, there's one other, uh, I mean, there's a lot of other different questions burbling around, but there's one other one that several folks have kind of come up with. And that's if you could talk for a minute about um, the differences between hypothesis and perusal. Sure. Well, I think business models. There are different business models for sure. Um, and, uh, but they, you know, I think perusal uh, does a lot of the same, you know, spiritual work that we're talking about, bringing people together on text, having the social reading experience. Uh, my understanding of their business model is, is mostly, uh, you know, students are purchasing text through their um, textbook store or through their bookstore. Um, our model for, uh, for distribution is more for schools to decide that they want to bring collaborative annotation to course documents uh, more broadly. Um, of course, readings more broadly, not just uh, particular textbooks that are, that are purchased. And, uh, you know, the schools would, would largely shoulder that, that, that cost rather than the students. Um, I think uh, another difference is that hypothesis robustly anchors to the, the text of origin rather than to, rather than ingesting text into a platform for annotation. Um, hypothesis is really attaching itself to a PDF fingerprint in the case of a PDF or a URL in case of a website. And in that sense, the annotation is really, really attached there in a more permanent archival way um, than something that's happening in an ed tech platform. And depending on the longevity of that ed tech platform or the student's access to it can disappear. Um, so we know that Spencer is, <laughs> this is gonna sound scary, but we know that Spencer's annotated this inform, you know, information science uh, article. We know his user account has, and we can attach it to that article. And if you open that article in other contexts, we could, we could reattach it. And it's not really dependent on, even, even if he switched from University of Kentucky to um, you know, some other university that, that had Blackboard instead of Canvas, that same PDF would, you know, and the annotations would, would persist. Um, how's that for a start? That was good, uh, thank you. And I realized that we just, we just came up on the hour here and so we should probably um, give anyone who uh, wants to take off a chance to do that, including any panelists, we've taken up a lot of your time and we know you have other things to do. So if you need to, to take off, um, we wanted first to thank you very much for uh, joining us here in this webinar um, and being part of the community around Hypothesis, thank you. Um, and to thank everyone who attended. Um, we can stick around for a few minutes if people uh, still wanna continue the chat and discussion, um, but we certainly want to give folks a chance to leave if they need to get on with their days. And this is going to be recorded. Uh, and if you registered, you'll get a copy of the recording. And um, so you can share it with colleagues. Uh, or if you dropped off, I guess you can watch it later. But I guess if you dropped off, then you wouldn't hear me saying that. So That's right. How about just like one, any last words from the campus, from our panelists, just since, since I've talked so much, you can just say goodbye, but you know, uh, any tips for teachers using annotation in the classroom about, uh, yeah, any advice? Yeah, I am. Um, I don't really have a tip. I just wanted to say um, I have seen um, some much better writing from my students. I have, it, it's a large class. About a third of the students are um, not, uh, about a third of the students are English students, about uh, English lit students, about a third are from the sciences and a third are across the university. So a lot of the students are not uh, in the classroom because they want to major in reading and writing. Um, but um, I really have noticed a, a great um, increase in the quality of their critical reading and writing since I started using Hypothesis because it encourages them to dig down into a specific moment in the text and then to take into account um, the critical conversation which they can see happening um, around them. Uh, and I ask them to talk about it in their, when they revise their annotations. So um, it's just been really helpful for me. Um, which is one reason why I, I keep using it. So appreciate that. And I just want to underline the point, like it's not just about the reading, right? The it affects the writing. It affects a lot of other parts of a course. And I think that's that's absolutely critical. Julia, you said you didn't want to really zero in on what happens when a student meets a text. Maybe that's a moment to be more informal and uh, in process. Um, but those more pro those more product oriented assignments are going to be informed by 
that process and enhanced by that process. So you may measure it or see it later on. So that's a really important point. Spencer? Uh, my philosophy with any tool that you're trying out in the classroom is to just dive in and tinker with it. And that has been my experience over the past year as I've just been diving in and tinkering with Hypothesis. Um, and I haven't broken anything yet, so uh, don't, uh, don't worry, I guess, about whether or not you're doing best practice, whether or not you're meeting the full potential of it. But I think that the best way to really try this out is just to try it out uh, and then build on what you've done each semester until uh, you get to somewhere that you're, you're really happy with. As a testament to that, I just want to say that Spencer, you know, installed the tool last semester and used it quite robustly, one of the top, you know, one of the most productive groups of annotators in, in the semester, in the spring semester. And I never talked to him. <laughs> I never, never had a conversation until now. So he went in there and tinkered and had success. Uh, but I do encourage you to also be in touch because I think we can collaborate and, and do really cool things more closely. Uh, to be clear, Jeremy was very helpful about reaching out and trying to talk to me. I was not very good about following my emails, so I owe him an apology. I, you've made up for it by being here, so I really appreciate it. Thanks. Uh, Lorna, do you have any last words? Um, just that I'm excited to continue to use it and hear how other people are using it. And, um, and I agree with um, Spencer about um, trying it out first. My, my favorite use of it really has been for my own work with my colleagues. And um, I could see a lot of applications for that. And then, and then it makes the, the work I'm doing with my colleagues, annotating text um, serves as a model that I can show students um, as I, um, you know, am showing them how, how to use annotations in, the, in academia and, and then also um, annotating with them to model the tool before they're having to use it, I guess would be a tip. But um, yeah, Great. so thank you. Thank you, Lorna. Yeah, my tip is similar to what Lorna just said, is just um, having to sort of explicitly model using the tool, but also model how to annotate in critical ways. Um, I sort of skipped over that for those first few weeks of my course and I found that not a lot of my students know how to really do that very well. So just me hopping in there doing that, pointing out the features on the tool like, hey, you can put a visual in, you can link to other things, like just modeling that process was, was really key for them and then they started to pick it up. So that makes me think of, of modeling the different types of approach, the different types of annotation that might happen, or the different types of disciplinary practice that are necessary to cultivate and you could have different annotation assignments that focus on each one. I could talk about this stuff all day. I really appreciate your time today. Uh, Megan, Spencer, Lorna, and Julia, Nate, uh, Caitlin, thanks for uh, running things uh, on the chat and the Q&A. And everybody for the overwhelming turnout and an interest in Hypothesis, reach out to us, education at Hypothesis, or use the, the deck to go ahead and uh, jump in and start playing around. Thanks, everybody.